But uh, yeah, I can do well. So if you Jermaine, I don't know if this is for you or for the panel, so you can defer to later if you want, but I work with the Friends of the Townslot Church, which is, you know, the, the Presbyterian Church that was very engaged in the Underground Railroad, which is kind of the heart of the Zimperian and the Barnington Center. One of the things we struggle with is, obviously that was a primarily white Presbyterian Church. It was an integrated church, with which was very unusual for that time. But how do we, we have like a thousand students come through every year, except for COVID, but uh, how do we tell the story and make sure we don't leave out the free black community? I mean, we always make sure we tell the kids about that, you know, that it was primarily the free black community who was part of the underground railroad. But yeah, when you've got this church, you know, this congregation and stuff, is there anything we need to be doing to make sure that we are being authentic in the story of how the free black community helped uh, was a primary source of the underground railroad? Yeah, I think for so long the uh, the story of the white abolitionists have been centered in the story, so I think that we have to recenter the black narratives in the story because we everybody talked about. It. All those examples that were left out, all those histories that were hidden. So I think we have to pull those and make sure to recenter those in the telling. Um, and just make sure that that is put up front and centered um, to the story that we're telling. So that to me, along with the authentic, authenticity, like you said, is the key. Yeah, maybe that would be a good idea because I think so. I think that question um, really is a good segue actually to bringing the underground stuff. So I think maybe we'll just go ahead and um, and do that, and then we'll allow some of our other panelists to answer that question. And then um, the panelists are Dr. Erica Lawrence, who is the principal of Whitney Young Elementary School uh, in Louisville. And she's also a board member of the Floyd County Library, of which we are a branch here at the Carnegie Center. And so we're really lucky to have um, her perspective here as a, as a school, person who works in the school. So I think that, that she might, might have some um, uh, interesting insight on the education aspect around the underground railroad story. We also have Dr. Giovanni Bennett, who is a artist. A cultural research, a researcher and cultural strategist, and a, an educator as well. Um, very lucky to have her perspective here from a, as a creative um, uh, person and educator. And then we also have Tiara Deacon, who is also an artist and is a, a graduate of the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and happens to be a Carnegie Center Museum educator. So. We are really happy to have these three folks come up and join um, the panel. So let's bring you guys up to the Thank you. 
Anyone else that would like to go first, you absolutely are welcome to, and if not, I can take it off answering the question. Um, so personally, um, I didn't know of how important Louisville and Kentucky were um, to the story until I started working here. It wasn't something that I learned growing up. It wasn't something I ever heard about. I never even really understood that so many enslaved people had come through Kentucky and that Kentucky was a, a marketplace. Um, so I think that there is a large part of our history that isn't being explored because it's the negative side, because people don't want to talk about it, people don't want to uh, blame Kentucky. But without including that part of the story, then it is extremely difficult to contextualize what was going on right across the water, what was going on here in Indiana. Um, and I think that you know, water has always been something that's super important to humanity, and that the, the Ohio River is so important to the Underground Railroad and the story and the history that it is our duty to continue to try and make sure that that story gets out there. And I think that definitely in this generation, we're doing more of that. And you know, these are stories that I'm hearing now more than I have ever in my life. This um, experience today is a slightly emotional because um, to hear, hear Jermaine speak with so much passion um, about the Underground Railroad. My stepfather, um, who is no longer here, Dr. Uh, J. Blake Hudson, was an expert, a scholar in this field. So we would ask him questions and different things over the dinner table. Um, but hearing the past passion, um, Jermaine, that you shared, and hearing the stories, and no matter how many times you hear them, it still push you into a space. Um, for me, a pain as an artist of creative exploration, how to bring the ancestors into this space um, with magic, uh, with, with the gifts that I have as an artist, and also finding different ways to uncover the stories. So if I remember, because I remember your question, uh, like how are the stories shared now? That was is the essence of your question. How well, do you feel like uh, we're doing preserving that history? In how we're doing and preserving the history in this area. <sighs> Well, I mean, asking in, in general, in this, in this area, in this region, um, asking someone off the street, what do you know about slavery? Um, it, it, from a child all the way to someone who's 60 or 90 years old, you definitely find there's this huge gap <coughs> of information. So it's, it's, it's right there. Um, and then on top of that, there's just a lot of just a lot of misconceptions. Um, but those stories, as Jermaine shared, are significant because we're always in a in a time, especially now during a pandemic, a global pandemic, um, with so many disparities in so many di different categories, for the need for innovation, for a need for something new. And when you go back to a time where everybody thought slavery was just it, there was no doubt that like, this system of separating families, rapes, lynching, all the time, like all the whippings and pain and, and, and selling someone for a couple hundred dollars or whatever, that, that was just, that was going to be it. And to reimagine a future 
that could be different. And not only that, you're connecting it with diverse people who live in different places. And for some people, they use art. They use the sky, they use the moon, they use the stars to imagine that then. And now let's go to 2021 where we're facing something we've never seen. And maybe we're, I mean, some people, and some things, some disparities that exist, it's like we'll always be like this, but will it? Or can we imagine something differently? So revisiting these stories again, I love the way you said that, Jermaine, and, and remembering the humanity and the creativity that we have, the innovation that we have, and reliving, relearning, uncovering the magic that was then through the tears gives us a lot of fruit to do work now. I would say um, one element of the Underground Railroad, especially as we think about this local area of New Albany, Indiana, and I'm really grateful that the Carnegie exhibit addresses this, that New Albany was not, um, yay, all of the people who are trying to escape slavery, come here, we beg you to come to our place and stay with us here in New Albany. That is not true. It didn't happen, then the exhibit acknowledges that, that people who came here trying to escape the horrors of slavery, there was, there was a bond over their head. And so people in Indiana sent them back. They made money, they made profit. People in New Albany made profit over sending people back into slavery, into the horrors of slavery. And I think we like to romanticize that, oh, Indiana was a free state. Indiana was a state where you, you came here and you were caught. You were, and to think that you were sent back for money was the least of the horrors. You were probably raped, beaten, terrorized, tortured before they sent you back. And then they made money off of sending you back. And that happened here in New Albany. And we need to acknowledge the reality of that, that what Indiana is and what it was and we've got to really, as we talk about preserving these stories, we need to recognize that Indiana is not um, a hero here. There are a lot of horrors that happen in Indiana, people of color. And that we look back at this and understand that, yes, the original sin of the United States was slavery. And that we have to look at it in reality and truth, and that we tell these stories in truth. Because when we are really honest about it, Isabel Wilkinson talks about Adolf Hitler marveled at how and learned about how to treat Jewish people from how Americans treated black people. He marveled at that. And what even was more magnificent to him was that you all think me, Adolf Hitler, as being a criminal. You Americans are the criminals. You murder people, you hang them from trees, you post pictures of them, and you mail pictures of people hanging from trees for fun. It was so out of control that the United States Postal Service had to ban the postcards being sent of people hanging from trees because it was so vile. Can you imagine you work for the Postal Service and you're going through mail, sorting mail, and you see pictures of people hanging? pictures of men and their genitalia, they would see that as they're sorting the mail. So this law was passed, so now when you send those pictures, the law is not able to put them in an envelope. They can't be postcards anymore. So Adolf Hitler marveled at how the white um, the establishment was treating through Jim Crow, how they were treating black people like, okay, we're learning from that, and he talks about how he learned from that. We need to recognize that the horrors that happened here on this soil they were horrible. And we can't just say that, oh, there were, you know, we had the Underground Railroad and we had people who were in the free states of the North and that they helped us. This was a network of, yes, of people who, who were of black skin and yes, there were people of white skin who helped, but this was a dynamic system to keep people enslaved and keep them separated from the wealth of this country, the wealth of education, we're going to keep that from them for generation after generation after generation. And so now is the time that we get to tell the story 
we talk about it, but we gotta make sure that we don't romanticize the story as if, oh, we have all healed. We're not all healed. We are not healed. We have to work through the process of healing. So that's something that I definitely can appreciate this um, exhibit for, for making that real, and as a reminder that we still are in the healing process. And we can't go through that period of time as you know something that's either over or that everybody is okay, because we're not okay. White people are not okay, black people are not okay, brown, none of us are okay. We need to go through a process of reconciliation and healing. I just wanted to jump from that to address the question you said around teaching different ages. Um, as a teacher in training many, many years ago, uh, my mentor teacher, I was working in the West End of Louisville, and he's an older white man, and he taught all different types of subjects. I was trained in a visual arts teacher. I was in an elementary school. And he said, all right, Johnny, I have a test for you. You're going to do a slavery unit with the kids, and you're going to use the follow the drinking board um, story um, with your reading rainbow. And I'm brand new. I don't, I mean, I've, I've always had educators in my life, but I'm a brand new teacher. So there's a lot that I don't know, especially tackling that. But I was like, I am determined, I'm going to get this. So I'm teaching a class of mostly um, black children and working class white children. And I'm going to go in there. And we did follow the drinking boy. I don't know if you've seen Rhea Rainbow and remember that song. And I listened to that movie over and over and over. And um, Levert, Levar, Levar. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes, he is so lovable. So good, amazing person. So I go and I do this lesson. I'm putting music appreciation and art appreciation in this lesson. And there was this little black boy, um, somehow, little black boy who said, okay, there, he, I think it was first grade. And he said, okay, um, so there's this bad thing like slavery, so what did they do? And the old, my, my mentor, my host teacher was a little, he said, don't talk about that. So then we go into resistance movements. And I didn't have, it was such a the dismay and horror in his face as I explained, like, you know, enslaved Africans didn't have rights. And they don't listen to things. They had to do what they said. And it was so, a little confusing. Um, because as I was saying it, I realized children do not have certain rights. They are in a system where they they have to follow certain rules. So that was an interesting thing as an educator, like, okay, I'm talking to human beings who don't have certain rights, and they have a whole container of what they can do and not do. And then the little boy looked at me with horror around, around, well, did, did basically, did my people do anything? And uh, my host teacher, bless his heart, he said, don't, don't address that. And I was in a moment of confusion and loss of words of how to share that information. So that moment was gone. And I, all, that moment always stayed with me. And the beautiful thing, you know, in 2021, there's so many, I encourage everyone, there's so many different ways to engage students uh, with the information, there's phenomenal um, uh, methodologies, approaches to bring students in about all types of topics, including slavery. And we can hold space for all those emotions that students can have and respect their intelligence that they can do it. And, and just be nimble and with that dance as an educator and adapting and scaffolding that information and seeing what the themes are because this generation in front of us are dealing with a lot of crazy stuff. 
like climate, you know, climate change and things that are really, really serious. I mean, for them to get used to this pandemic right here, they're already know something is not right about human beings right now. These adults are making some strange decisions all the time. They're not getting along. So talking about American slavery or the slave slavery internationally and finding best practices that are out there all over the world to talk about this legacy and to talk about the, the and I, I speak of magic, of the magic and the faith and the spirituality that will support people to even have moments of joy through pain and the art that was created and different things that it came out of human beings through this there. So with, just answer, addressing that question, there are best practices out there. So definitely encouraging um, that. And there's, you know, along with Carnegie, there, there are great museums um, and institutes around around the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually would, oops, it off. Huh. Um, I actually would be interested in hearing, and just to go back to that comment about the questions about teaching this concept to children, um, to ask about what your experience is like. Some people up here on stage have, have children, and I would be interested in knowing um, at what age did you or do you talk about slavery with your children? And I want to preface that by saying that um, I was talking to an artist named Ramona Lindsay about this and about how as Carnegie educators, we have brought the story of the Underground Railroad to many, many children in Floyd County. and. For many of them, it was their first time hearing about slavery. And I told that to Ramona Lindsay, artist, and she said, for the white kid, what it is. But not necessary, but she's like, the black kids are gonna have known that story from their families. And that was, that was, I was like, yeah, you're probably right. This is something that um, different families are coming to this with different information when we bring this story to them. Um, so anyway, I wanted to, I'm sorry that the microphone seems to have died, maybe. But uh, I'm sorry uh, about that. It might, it might die again, but I'm wondering your opinions on what it's been like to tell your children about it, if, you have, if, you're, if you're willing to share that information. I think as early as they asked about it, right? Um, the story that I told about the textbook that had enslaved people listed as workers and immigrants, um, one of the people who brought that to the attention of the public was a kid. The kid looked at this book and was like, hold oh, on, that's not the day. What happened? Like, what's going on here? Like, what do you mean immigrants and workers? So they wrote a letter to the teacher. I don't know if it was in middle school. I can't remember exactly, but um, children are very perceptive. Um, they're very smart, very intelligent. So they will ultimately, I think, start asking questions and then you gauge their engagement, you know, what they can handle and kind of lead that discussion always with truth telling though um because there's just so many sugarcoating and lies right even when i was talking about those slave uh martyrs in downtown mobile i noticed on that the uh the archivist or whoever wrote that said that um this whole institution of, of slave transportation in mobile it was shunned by the community and i kind of scratched my head at that like it was shunned because there was like hundreds of slave firms in mobile operating. So how is it shunned if you, I mean, if you go out here and people don't want to drink and you have alcohol, stores on every corner, right? People are going to, it's not shunned if they're on every corner, right? Like people are going to say something about it. Like, hey, we don't want all these things on our streets, right? So 
I think the language, again, it's always this kind of weaving and trying to sugarcoat and not tell the truth. So I think children can handle the truth um, at, a lot younger than what we think they can. There's always that thing with kids, right? Like, you got to talk to them before their friends tell them about certain things, right? Or you're going to hear whatever the world has to tell them about these things other than somebody who's really trying to engage them in such a way that is going to make them think, that is going to help them mature um, to where, you know, other people might tell them in a way that's not real, it's not right, it's unfruitful. So mm -hmm. that's my thought. Mm -hmm. My perspective is probably a little maybe nuanced. Um, I don't have struggles with teaching and have been educating young people about our history. I think the what we need to make sure that we do is that our adults are lifelong learners mm -hmm. and that adults continue to learn and continue to make any knowledge. And that will absolutely, um, when adults grow and get better, our, our children grow and get better. Mm -hmm. So the, the kids are easy. So the word the kids are easy is the adults that we got to learn. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then it's funny, going back, it's not funny actually, but going back to that first well, that teacher in service experience, the kids were like ready, like just, just give, give it to me. And I was the one that was lost for words. I needed to go back and like figure out methodologies and approaches to get, because they were like, okay, and what happened? And these were very good six, seven, eight year old children. And, um, it, it, it's just a very, just teaching as it is a co-creation. It's a very nimble experience. It's a dance. So children will share how much, like, okay, I got that piece of information. I'll move on. And, and I'm super grateful for the publishers, the people who fund projects, whether it is um, museums, arts initiatives, different ways to engage with the narrative so people can come to it in different ways, including um, books. And there's so many different books. Even the books that have half-truths or incorrect truths, being able to sit with a child and let, okay, let's look at this page and just talk about it. Very, you know, just, just different practices that I've definitely encouraged. That I'm always going back to look at it for myself because I have a, a six-year-old and also my practice as an educator. Just always looking at what, you, what are you doing over there? Oh, that's a great thing. I'm gonna use that. Uh, so I don't have children, um, but I think that. me and a part of a lot of people I'm sure that want to say as soon as children have questions is when answers should start but really sometimes children won't have questions if they're not in a community in which they're faced with anything that would prevent provide those questions to come into their mind it won't happen um, so I think that it's extremely important to open up children to the world as it is, as a diverse place, as a place that is highly nuanced um, as soon as possible. And I think that, you know, there are a lot of ways to have those discussions that are age appropriate without sugarcoating it, without lying in any way, but just telling them in a very simple, straightforward way. And a lot of times people are amazed at what children can understand. Mm -hmm. There's a few questions back there. Would you be able to project your voice? So we'll go to Erica and then uh, and then the gentleman. Okay. Um, thank you, all of you, for all of your words of wisdom and uh, <laughs> expertise here. There were a number of things that you said uh, journey that really stuck out to me. But one was uh, the word of fugitive slaves ever free. Yes. And the reason that stuck out to me was a couple of things. In thinking about this exhibition and thinking about like the markers that we see all over. Now I wanna I wanna address the one about Lucy uh, Nichols. There's a lot of them that say this network for freedom. 
as like the, the, the phraseology that's used. And like for me, the question always is, is what is the etymology of the word? And how are we using it? Are we using it correctly? And who's using it in which way? Kind of like the word community. When somebody says community that doesn't look like me, I'm going to ask you what that means. Uh, I'm going to ask that to people that look like me too, but if I'm in a space with predominantly black people and then there's a white person that says the word community, I'll need to define what you mean by that because it may not be my definition. And I'm saying that all of the precursor because um, from my understanding, the etymology of free is the German word frau, which means to love. And if freedom really means to love, have we gotten to a point, and I, I think my question really is more like, what do you see as freedom in this exhibition? How do we talk about the Underground Railroad and make, bring it to now into the context of freedom? And does freedom in this thing really mean the power of self-determination, the state of free will? When we talk about things where it's not free, because it's free for some, it's even things like talking about education of children. That phrase, off, that phrase, my white grandmother used to say all the time, just let them be children. But black family members would always be like, we don't get to be. So there's a there's this divide that sort of sits in some of that, you know, right? And like, what is the divide within freedom? We're talking about roads to freedom, freedom seekers, they got in the free state. Not only do we need to change the way that that word and that word is used in uh, exhibitions, but how do we do it? in other things? How do we bring it into these markers? How do we update some of this? How does it become a conversation amongst us to have at our dinner table, at the work, um, at the water cooler? How are we talking about being free? And to go back to um, your question on like, have we made it here? You know, how have how, how we moved this conversation forward? How have we moved it around that terminology of freedom? Uh, and I get by, you know, you go to a networking event and you're looking five steps ahead like a chess move, like what am I going to be able to get out of this person later down the line of the future? And I think for me, freedom is tied to that idea of the mind chapter, community of family. We're so individualistic now. We're so closed off and insulated now that a lot of people don't have that concept. To me, that's freedom to go out, be able to be loved, to be able to love other people, see humanity in other people. And that is for me, uh, you just really spoke to me on that as far as like the definition of freedom, right? It's not over, it's not finished, because I think we're still closed off so much from conversations like this. There's people like you said that are still in pain, that are still dealing with the history and the present and how the history ties to the present. James Baldwin said we're trapped in history and history is trapped in us. And there's so many people who don't wanna look back and see that and see how that still affects us today. So until we, break those chains in our hearts and our minds like that is the, the new conversation that I think we have to have now is like how do we get free in our hearts and minds right um, and that's how we move forward so that's my opinion. Yeah. 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 of how to speak 
and have to be extremely specific um, to connect with narratives and stories. Yes, I can make it quick. Um, so it's interesting because um, I was thinking earlier about how we talk about how um, people ran to freedom or ran for freedom when really it was freedom from slavery. We lose a lot of nuance when we use the word freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you like a microphone? Uh, no, I don't need it. Okay. I'm a preacher, so. Oh. <laughs> also not in the state. Indiana, Honolulu, but recently relocated. Um, so I, I am a minister, and I participate, and I sometimes facilitate and lead racial justice education workshops in predominantly white spaces, um, and typically with a, with a black American woman pastor friend of mine. One of the things that, uh, comes up regularly, and I think that the PBS documentary came out in the early 90s, Race, the Power of Illusion. There's a section in there where uh, the uh, historian, actually a black American historian, he says, you know, when slavery was in the United States was over or outlawed, right? Instead of telling the truth about it, our society had constructed an entire hierarchy and lie of which we call race now, right? And I, I was kind of interested that this hasn't come up in this presentation because uh, we I've heard the words connecting the dots between the history is there, right? Why can't we move on? Right? This is this is right. I mean white people say this to particularly to black Americans all the time. Well, get over it, right? It's over whatever. But I wonder if you could speak to um, that kind of elephant in the room. Why can't we really get on uh, in society and get along? Um, and I, I just want to say that my belief is that we, as a society, have not told the truth. We constructed a lie that, of, that is called race, as if race was real. Baldwin says to us, teaches us, right, that no white person came to this country being white. They were Finnish, they were Swedish, they were Germans, until someone told them they were white. And then the spectrum of whiteness expands in order to keep black at the bottom, right? So I wonder if you guys could speak to the connecting dots of the legacy, as particularly for white members of the audience, um, why we can't get over it. Thank you, Kendall, for taking the question. Um, it's all right if I start off. Um, so one important distinction to make is that with the 13th Amendment, um, Slavery was ended except for in prisons. And very quickly after that, we see um, there was a brief period in the Reconstruction era where we see a lot of free black people succeeding. And very quickly come the black coats and many reasons to send black people to prison. And if you look at prisons today, they are predominantly filled with black people, black men in particular. And um, America holds most of the world's prison population. So when we think about these things, it's not necessarily that the system and oppression of slavery ended, it's that it was transferred. And it still permeates in every part of American culture today. And just the um, extend it to look at art centers and, and museums, why it's important to have um, this conversation today is because it is a space like traditionally museums and art centers have been a space of self-directed learning and ways you can explore um, complex topics and it even fits within a lot of museums where things have been stolen and there has been a legacy where people have not felt comfortable coming into certain spaces based off of race. The legacy around how race has shaped 
communities and lives um, live today, including in health disparities. So those issues are the reason we're still having the long conversation and the impact of intergenerational uh, trauma. So it comes out in, in, in spirit and in, in mind and body and, and your genetics and the just the collective trauma. So you definitely definitely share. It's still important. Anybody else want to comment on that? I mean I think um, Dr. Bennett is you know touching started on that very important topic. We think about every domain of American life today, black people have a major discrepancy with our white peers. So every, when we talk about health disparities, um, even death and childbirth, home ownership, so health, then we have economic disparities, uh, home ownership, school achievement, every area of, of human life, there are major discrepancies. That didn't just happen. It's not a true statement to say that black people are inferior, or black people are just um, dumb, and that's why they can't learn. Black people are, um, have bad health, and that's why, oh, that's why their health outcomes are bad. That's not true. There's, there's a story behind these numbers, and it's really important for us to investigate the, the why. Why is this existing? Why is this real? And then that helps us to uncover the systematic and the historical issues that have happened to keep these numbers where they are. Um, and so that's why we have to continue to study this and examine these trends and really work towards that healing and reconciliation. Yeah, I'll just say that uh, you speak to the point of this construct of racism, right? This construct of race. We know that there was scientific racism. We know that the concept of race uh, was constructed to place people in inferior positions and create this hierarchy that you talked about. And I remember reading this quote from Martin Luther King, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he says that this hierarchy was created, Jim Crow was created, we you know all the atrocities that happened with that. And he says that the white man ate Jim Crow so that he, you know, you, you could be poor and white, whatever, but as long as you're still white, you're over other people who are not white, whether it be black people at the bottom of this hierarchy and then you go on and so forth and so on. And the I question of whether white people have actually thrown up Jim Crow at this point. I think it's still ingested. We see it in the media. We see it with all the things going on today in society. I wouldn't say all the things, but just so many aspects of society that this hierarchy still exists. So. That to me is what I go back to when I think about that question. So appreciate that. Thanks for answering the question. Another question? Also, if I could make a comment to the question and just kind of maybe get your take on it. Uh, one of the things I thought about in reference to how can people kind of digest this entirety of the you know systematic uh, injustices and. and uh, disenfranchising the community and everything. And I, I, I try to simplify it as, if I went to anyone's home, and, and where your computer area is or whatever, you had a lot of cords that were there, and they were tangled. And I tried to untangle them, I could probably do that successfully. Because that entanglement happened naturally. It just happened by the effect of you using it. However, if I went onto Google, and I typed in, how to table the knot, how to make a cord, how to make this where you can't untangle it. There is absolutely no way that haphazardly from pulling at this, you can untangle this thing, right? And I think the biggest thing that people have to understand is the systematic oppression didn't happen haphazardly. People who are very smart, people who read more in a month than people read in their entire life, who research different communities, who research just like people research the black community. You know, Jerry who research other communities and see how he could affect the black community. I just feel like once um, the two-part process would be one, internalizing and understanding this wasn't haphazard. It was a systematic, designed, intentional thing. So the only way to undo it, the only way to undo a design 
system is to come up with an, an alternative design system to undo that. The second part of it would be ensuring that the methods are there so that it, it can't be entangled again. So, uh, and try to just completely digest that. It's not a tangible, solid answer. Once we get to here, we're complete. It's more of an understanding of it. Once we all understand this was by design, therefore we need another system to untangle this, and then let's put it up in place so that it cannot be handled again. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. yeah I, I, I just want to make a comment that one of the things that I think is helpful is to try to actually name white supremacy mm -hmm. and to actually define it. We use, we use the words racism and white supremacy should be, they are synonymous. They, they're, they're synonymous. Racism is white supremacy, white supremacy is racism. But what does that mean? And I think, I, don't, I wonder if the panelists will agree with this definition, partially borrowed by a friend of mine who teaches at McCormick Seminary, Dr. Reggie Williams, uh, author of Bonhoeffer's Black Jeans and Cyrus and German Warriors around here, um, my lovely author. That uh, what white supremacy really is, is the manufacturing and maintenance of spaces and places for whites only. And so it's the creation of white as normal. So that's, that's the system. It's, it, it's not really so many, perhaps, spaghetti noodles tied together as it is the, the idea that white is normal. And when you, I think that's the simplest and straightforward definition. That's why we can't change. Because we systematize a slave system for economic advantage to give an underbelly for this country, right, for white freedom, and then develop a theory of race that's a complete lie to justify the moral offenses before God and humanity. So, so, so this system makes us yearn. In black community, right, perhaps it's called self-hatred. But it makes people yearn for an idea of humanity that is in the image of whiteness, white Jesus, white whatever, white beauty ideal. This uh, now urban painter out of Princeton who called it black female historian, calls it the white beauty ideal. Um, I wonder how the four of you might respond to uh, that idea, the connection between uh, the black struggle in the United States for freedom, for all of white supremacy, and the need of white people in the 21st century in the United States for themselves to be free from what I call as a preacher, the demon of whiteness. There's no such thing, it's a lie. I wonder if that might be too much or whatever, but I, I thank you again for allowing me to say more. Say, you know, and this whole concept of normal, why is it normal? How does that happen? Right? So your, your question is what are... My question's all over the place. Okay, so... <laughs> I'll shut up, I think. No, so... Well, I'll start with the struggle for black folk to those who it's so interesting the discourse you can be at you can talk to afro brazilians you can talk to someone in chicago and hear like yo you get it you get it you get it okay because that the language where we're like okay well possibly it is it is beautiful having white passing and white folks um learn about the demons uh, of, of white supremacy and structural oppression. But at different points, black people all over the world is like, okay, we're gonna have to see what assets are in the room for folks who are interested in this work. Whether you are degreed up and you can create all the data sheets that show that the work in the system to show this is not fair. Can we make this fair? Can a system be kind to people who make artwork and who make music that can bring you in? And while you're brought in, you are learned, you're learning, this is not kind. Can you change? From people who do the policy work. So it's just a, that asset-based approach of whatever gifts that you have in the room for the struggle. And if you can write a book, 
that brings everybody in, like Kende X with anti-racist book, as a tool. Like, hey, let's use that. You know, not everybody agrees with that book, um, but it is a tool, a part of a whole entire resistance movement. Um, and also, um, another thing that I'm so grateful that's coming up in this day and time is around healing, healing arts and healing-centered engagement, trauma, trauma um, sensitive and trauma-informed approaches and places of just resting. And that's a whole different thing that, you know, in the 1970s, there were people who were like, oh, rest, but it's loud and proud now that if you need to rest as someone who has been touched by systems of oppression, that is an act of resistance. When you do not get involved in toxic work culture, that is an act of resistance. So different ways of looking at the talents in the room, of connecting to mental health providers and healers in your community that will give you strength to do the work with your gifts and to look at people in your community with the, with the gifts. When it does come to um, white folks um, learning about systemic oppression, it, it, it is powerful for those who leverage their privilege and power in the struggle. They are dear, they are brave, and it's important. And creating space for all of us in the work, as much as you have capacity, which is, I'm loving that word too, that is loud and proud. It's always been, you know, it's been said for a, a long time, but that word capacity, how much capacity do you have? And creating space for people in the messiness around how, how you participate and resist in a system. So going back to slavery, again, is such an eye-opener to see how people in a different time would make those connections and the capacity that they had at different moments in horror and then the magic that they also made. And I keep going back to the word magic because there's sometimes those dark moments from whether it was the Jim, Jim Crow South or North to the moment a woman has to just pull away from her child that is going to be sold. To jazz singers who had to go to the back of a hotel to perform for a crowd and not get paid and people steal their music. So all these different moments where there's magic and you're still creating and you're still creating a story of hope, of faith, of a deeper imagination. And a place sometimes that you can't even use words, definitely not English words to express it. So. I don't know if that it <laughs> broke down your question. Um, does anybody else have any burning, burning questions? Oh, some more from Terry. Yeah, I don't know if, if there's even an answer to this. I'll probably direct it to Jermaine or Dr. Lawrence. Dr. Lawrence. Dr. Lawrence. Oh, and, uh, I've recently retired from a position where I was at I mean, high school a lot. I saw the, the plays, I saw uh, the athletic program, I saw the band. I've been involved with elected officials, with a lot of community boards. When I was at Duwamie High School, I see this incredible diversity of kids, talented, bright kids involved from, you know, with a lot of very backgrounds. I looked at our elected officials, white. I looked at our boards, white. I looked at uh, leaders in the community, business owners, white. I looked at this audience, mostly white. What's happening to our kids? That bright, talented, those young people that should be part of this community. We talked about New Albany being a hostile territory, you know, during the Civil War. 
you know, even though we were a free state, I'm not so sure that we're not still a hostile territory when I look at how our kids are being excluded. What do we as a community need to do to change that? And maybe there's not an easy answer to that, but I think we need to start thinking about that because there are so many bright, talented kids of color who are not being given the opportunities that I, as a white person, has. It is hostile. It's and I feel so personally impacted of this hostility that I myself am a graduate of New Albany Floyd Schools and I took my kids out. I removed my children because I saw the real tangible evidence of exclusion, of racism, and I took them out because I was not going to allow that to impact my children. Um, and when I think about how it impacted me in the trajectory of my life, I and mean, someone may be able to say, oh, but you know, you're a graduate of DePaul University, this wonderful school in Indiana, and then you went on to finish your doctorate, and you've done postdoctoral studies, and blah, 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 and you have a great career. What would my life have been like if I had a K-12 experience where people affirmed me, where people told me that I was brilliant and I had a mathematical mind that was amazing. If, if I was a theater kid in New Albany, if, wow, the idea that, you know, it takes Lynn manuel Miranda to say that we're doing colorblind casting, because people would tell me, you can't play that role, Erica, because you're, you're black. And I thought that was real. I thought that was a true statement, that that was a white role, and there was no way I could be in a white role. So I made the decision to move my kids out because I wanted them to be in a learning environment where they were affirmed, and um, they had community, and maybe I'm gonna give them a shot at a K-12 experience that I didn't have. Some may say, you're not hurting Erica, and you know, I do, I mean, I live a great life, I'm very happy. But what would have happened if I looked like you? Like, what would my life be like if I looked like you? Because every space I go in, I'm a black woman. And I own it, I'm very proud to be a black woman. But what happens when you walk into a store and you know you can pay for it? Like, you know you have the money. That's what it's like when you get to walk in with those, that, that um, package of being a white person. That's the confidence So I'm good. Nobody's gonna, you know, not give me something because of who I am. So, um, yes, I live in this community, but I recognize what's happening in this community, and I've gotta make changes for the people that I love, and those are my children. Um, that, that's really, I mean, I didn't, I recognize what's happening in New Albany Floyd schools and it makes me really sad that um, I see it. I see, not only do I see it, I even hear the absence of dialogue. Like nobody even talks about it. I go to school board meetings. Nobody talks about what's happening with black kids at school board meetings. Nobody talks about the suspension and expulsion rate in New Albany High School. Nobody talks about it. There's an absence of a dialogue. So the people who make policy for New Albany Floyd schools Policy discussions happen at board meetings. That's where you make policy. But we get busy talking about, even before COVID, we're talking about soccer fields. That's what we talk about. Who's paying for the soccer field? Where the excess money for the soccer field is going? Really? There are people who are proverbially dying in your schools. You have black people who are going to be adult citizens in New Albany Floyd who are dying in your schools because they can't read. And because we expel them or put them on half-day schedules, so they stay home half the day, like that's crazy that you have all these kids, even in elementary school, who are on half-day schedules. But there's no outcry of this at a board meeting where policy happens. So then when these people who are 12 become 21, where do they live? They're gonna live down here with Frank Lou, get the sheriff, because we have a new jail. That's what we're preparing our young people for, because we don't affirm them in school. We don't affirm, we have disparities, we have issues. 
We have outcome issues for our kids, K through 12. And children become adults in the blink of an eye. You know, we marvel like on Facebook, right? And we talk about how, oh my goodness, they were a baby and now look, they're in nursing school and oh, it's graduation. That's real. Kids grow up real fast and they remember how people treat them. So they remember that, oh wow, you affirmed me. Or, oh, I remember you told me I would never be a doctor. I had a science teacher at Scrivener who told me we'll never be a doctor. That's straight AIDS, okay? I think I was a smart kid. I told me I, to my face that I would never be a doctor. I'm like, how could you, as a professional, form your lips to say that to me? But he did, felt nothing about it. Well, I would never, I mean, as an educator, I would never tell a child they can't be. But we, it happens. And so I know if it happens to me, it happens to other kids. When I look at the demographics for what's going on in New Albany, that's why we don't see black people in these spaces. That's why we do not see people of color in these spaces of you know, the Carnegie Center. This is an amazing center for learning and art and culture. But we don't see faces that reflect the diversity of this community because there are barriers at every turn of the road. So those are things that as a community we have to think about. Because are we okay with this idea that we just put people in jail or we keep people in poverty so they live in public housing and you know, so people who live in, you know, who are getting assistance then feel another barrier or shame and they don't participate fully in our community. That's a problem. We've got to take care of that or we're or because there's an absence of a dialogue, we must be okay with it. So the people of New Albany must be okay with it. So we don't say anything. We don't talk about it at city council meetings. We don't talk about it at school board meetings. Um, we just marvel over this new jail that we have, how pretty it is. If I hear one more thing about this stupid jail, I'm really gonna blow my top because we are not doing what we need to do to care for the diverse community of color that we have here. But because nobody talks about it, it makes it seem like it's okay. 